You know, there's not much out there on the history of the Texas Jam. Uh, there is a picture book that came out not too long ago. And coming out in May, there will be a documentary on the Texas Jam. And joining us now on the ticket hotline is the guy who's putting together and producing this documentary, and he's been working on it for a long, long time. His name is Brian Hedenberg. Morning, Brian. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? All right. Doing well, we're doing great. Brian is a DFW native, and the documentary is going to focus on the very first Texas Jam in 1978. And so how did you get the idea to do this, and, and what has the documentary process been like for you? Well, it actually wasn't my idea. I, I was brought into it uh, later. It was actually um, a guy named James uh, Austin. Uh, it, was, it was his idea, mm -hmm. and he directed it and, and really uh, sort of inspired me to just help produce it. And then... What we originally thought was going to be a very quick and painless uh, undertaking turned out to be almost a decade long. And uh, due to fighting with agents and legalities and people trying to keep us from not releasing it because they wanted to do their own thing, and it was an absolute nightmare, but, uh, but we were able to finally finish it and, and get it out on iTunes in May. So is there... Uh... They're really good sounding audio because, I mean, Q102 carried this live, I think, one year. They had some pretty right. sophisticated uh, recording setups. Is, is there really good audio of some of these uh, concerts? Well, the, there was actually only, the only footage and audio that existed I know of. It was from Q102, and then NFL Films was hired to, to come and film it. But from, and when, of course, some of the news stations came in and did some B-roll, which we were able to to get everything except from NFL films because apparently it was filmed without the consent of any of the bands. <laughs> and so they wanted to try to release that years later and, and many of the bands had, had been very disenchanted about uh, being paid the right amounts, you know, so on and so forth. There was a lot of drama with that. But basically that footage has sat in 35 millimeter style uh, in some warehouse for decades. Who knows if it's even any good anymore. So everything we got is the only thing that exists. And in 1978, when the Texas Jam happened, there was, there was some question, I guess, before that as to whether there'd ever be another big outdoor concert in the state of Texas because what had happened in Austin a few years earlier? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because... A lot of people forget that Dallas really isn't that old. <laughs> I mean, it's not compared to a place like New York or, you know, that's been around for hundreds of years. And so things like this were still relatively new to us. And in the early 70s, they had done a outdoor concert at the, uh, the UT Field. And, and it was with the ZZ Top, and I think it was like 80,000 people. But they had destroyed the field so badly that they would never allow them to do that ever again in a, in a stadium in Texas. I mean, even more so then than now, it, Texas, our, our football reigned supreme. I mean, it was a, it was religion, and, and that was sacred ground. So somehow, years later, I was 77, uh, Louis Messina with Pace Concerts was watching a commercial about the Lone Star Beer-sponsored uh, Texas State Fair and had called his partner, David Krebs, and said, I have this great idea. We're going to do this three-day music event. It'll be the Texas World uh, Music Festival, and we'll have all these bands. We'll do the, the Cotton Bowl. And these guys couldn't have been very, uh, maybe mid-20s, late-20s, somehow convinced them to let them put on this concert. But they had to lay down plywood and black tarp all over the field. So in July, 78, it was already over 100 degrees that day. On the field, it was like a frying pan. It was somewhere around 120, 130, and somewhere between 80 and 100,000 people. And they ended up pulling it off to where there were no injuries, no one was hurt, and it was a huge financial success. And that's what continued every year thereafter for 10, 11 years into Monsters of Rock and, and all the other uh, stadium concerts but it was it was because of texas jam breaking that mold saying this is possible to pull off without disaster yeah i guess that's the um that, that's the thing that stands out too and that's what i would always make the um the b roll on the, on the news was people passing out because of the heat 
having a concert outdoors in Texas in July is pretty crazy <laughs> to begin with. It, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I, 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 you know, meeting these guys, it, it was really funny to, to watch them reminisce. And it's funny, you mentioned earlier about the, the double X's, which uh, actually had to do with the uh, with Krebs and uh, Frank Marino, who was into numerology at that time, and had called and said, oh, I found this license plate, and it had two X's on it. What, what do you think? And he did the numbers, and it all worked out. It was a good omen. But just having them reflect back on how hot it was, why they chose that time, and all the things that went into planning it, I mean, it was, um, those things just don't happen anymore. They just, they just don't. Um, whoever got to attend those, uh, they were very, very lucky because I, you know, other than like Lollapalooza or things like that, we'll, we'll just never experience anything like that. Uh, anyway. We're visiting with Brian Hedenberg. He's produced a Texas jam documentary that's coming out in May and available on iTunes in May. Is that what you said? Yes. All right, and it's about the very first Texas jam in 1978. And I'm looking at the lineup, and I'm wondering who the headliner was because you had Van Halen and Ted Nugent and Aerosmith and even Cheech and Chong were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, uh, well, they had a lot of comedy acts in between each major act. Each band played, uh, I think, 45 minutes. And um, Aerosmith was technically the headliner, but they made Frank Marino go on after him, which was like at 2 o'clock in the morning. So considering that everyone had been there since 6 a.m. to get into the gates, by the time Frank went on, nobody was there. It was like maybe 10,000 people. And uh, But Aerosmith was sort of pushed and promoted as the big headliner. Whatever became of Blackstone, the band that um, won the statewide competition to uh, get in there? Uh, from what I understand, three of them are in Amarillo. They were never able to find the rest of their band. Um, <laughs> one of them, uh, I believe, plays in a... I think, I think it's uh, Mark plays in a uh, church band. Uh, another one is uh, Mike... Is, the, is a physical therapist, and the, the the drummer does jazz fusion in California somewhere. I, I don't know. It's very no talk of a reunion or anything. Oh, I had no idea. We we actually came across uh, something about all these different bands claiming to have won this battle of the bands and uh, and playing, and so we actually did a separate documentary about that. Um, which will come out later, but we, we had to disassociate it with, uh, with this documentary because we wanted to focus on the main acts uh, that people would know. And it, it was just, this was easily, easily an hour and a half documentary that we had to crunch down to 42 minutes because at the time we were trying to get it on VH1. And doing the documentary, how many of the, the old performers did you get to sit down with and, and what were their memories of that Texas Jam? All of them except uh, Atlantic Rhythm Section, Aerosmith, and Van Halen. Even though we have footage and interview footage, I, I wasn't able to, to meet with them. A Aerosmith, basically, unless you're an A-lister or have a ton of money, they have no interest in talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, Van Halen, either half the band's in rehab, or I think, I think Dave is flying helicopters in New York. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it's been 30 years, so... Uh, Every, everybody kind of different, different things. But what was really cool was to come across guys like Eddie Money and Hart and Journey who were still out playing and are just the coolest people in the world. They, uh, they have uh, actually really good memory of what happened, and they would all sort of reflect on each other's shows that day or, from, or as much as they remember. Uh, Ted Nugent was probably the wildest interview uh, we asked him ten questions. He gave us two hours of answers, <laughs> <laughs> half of which was about hunting in Africa, and I'm not really sure what that had to do with our questions. <laughs> so um, it was good. I was going to say you still have uh, you know festivals and things like that, but as you mentioned, this just doesn't happen anymore in, in big stadiums. Why is that? Do you think with rock shows anyway? Well, I mean. <clears throat> I'll tell you, the, the, the guy who really 
opened my eyes to all of this. And he is just an encyclopedia of rock and roll, flat out, plain and simple, was Redbeard. And Redbeard explained at the end of this documentary, the last portion is why they don't happen and, 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 uh, and a lot of other things. But what he was sort of explaining was that the two main reasons these things don't happen is because, one, all the bands want a headline. And because of touring cost and gasoline and so on and so forth, they're, they're all incredibly expensive. But the second thing that most people don't think about is insurance. And back in the 80s, to insure a concert like the Texas Jam was well over a million dollars a day. I, who knows what that would be today. And the only insurers in the world that would even consider insuring something like this would be like Lloyd's of London. And because they're the only one, they can claim or, or, or charge anything they want. And so when you add all these factors together, I mean, the Texas Jam was $12 to go to. That was the ticket price. There's all general admission. Today, we see tickets in excess of two to $500. And even that barely breaks even. You, we went from being a nation where the DJs picked their own music and being a very creative society three, you know, three decades forward where everything is corporately sponsored and treated like stocks. And we just don't have that creative freedom anymore. And the festivals and rock shows are exactly like that. Uh, we went from something like the Texas Jam where a bunch of guys in their 20s could pull off one of the coolest shows at the time to where now unless Coca-Cola and a dozen other brands are controlling it um, and charging $500 a ticket, even then they're barely breaking even. They just, it, it's just the market of capitalism. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 they're just never going to be able to pull it off again. It certainly was unique. All right, the documentary Texas Jam comes out in May, and it's on iTunes. And any uh, other plugs you want to give for that documentary? Uh, you know, it's, it, <laughs> it was such. Uh, like I said, I mean, I think I think doing an inside documentary on Goldman Sachs would have been easier than pulling this thing off. <laughs> um, it was it was a lot of fun. It really opened my eyes to how much this country has really changed when it comes to the business of rock and roll. And the people I've met were amazing, and I love the fact that I still stay in touch with them. And we're really excited to you know for people to to get a, a peek into what it was like uh, back in the day when rock and roll reigned supreme. We look forward to it, Brian. Thanks for the time this morning. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. That's Brian Hedenberg. He is the producer of the Texas Jam documentary that's going to come out on iTunes in May. He mentioned Redbird. Uh, Redbird. Redbeard. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the legendary Redbird for... God. Redbeard. Uh, <laughs> for uh, giving me Brian's contact info and putting me in touch with him. Um, I told you what a thrill it was to get an email from Redbeard. That yes. was very, very cool. That's pretty huge. And when I think of the Texas Jam, I think of Q102 and the zoo and... Uh, LaBella and Rhodey and Redbeard and all those DJs and how consumed we all were with the Texas Jam. Yeah, I mentioned uh, one year they tried to carry it live and then I think they had some technical problems and things like that. And I swear I remember that. Remember like um, mm -hmm. like Live Aid, that was carried live on radio. Why don't radio stations do that anymore? You remember when radio stations also used to do a concert replay? Yes. Like after the big show yes. in town, they would then play all of these the in album order. cuts in order of how the show went down love yeah. that that yeah. was so it's cool great, it's it like a, a post game show you'd listen it was to. like a big q102 deal i think that mm -hmm. used to do that always yeah when did that stop when the ticket when, came on the air q102 <laughs> went away i guess when did we really lose our our rock stations mid 90s yeah well, q102 blew up in 1996 or 7 i believe and that that was pretty much it mm -hmm. i mean we still have a few out there but been bastardized a little bit. Well, here in a week, we will have uh, big free concerts in conjunction with the Final Four. Bruce Springsteen on that Sunday. And then Saturday will be Good Tim God. McGraw and Killers. So that will be kind of like the Texas Jam. Not quite. Let's not forget Jub Jam. We got oh, Jub no, Jam. It's only about a month away. Like the heir apparent yeah, to that's, the that's Texas we're Jam. We're carrying on the Texas tradition. And we're going to have more Perfect. on the Texas oh. Jam because the very final Texas Jam in 1988 featured the official vocalist of this show, Chris McKinley. He'll join us next with his stories from that event.
Hey, hey, it's Donovan here. Check out the show 